Game7 just released a report titled The State of Web3 Gaming. It looks at over 1900 games on 170 different chains over six years to give the full picture of the Web3 gaming market. In this video, we'll cover the key points of the report, including things like a general overview of the Web3 gaming market and whether or not it is actually growing. We'll look at all of the statistics about what chains game studios are actually utilizing to create their games on, and then how these companies are integrating Web3 technologies into their games. Big shout out to Game7 who created this report. A full link to the 61 page document covering all of the report will be linked in the description if you want to check that out yourself. With that said, let's get right into it. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you don't want to miss more Web3 content like this and like the video to help me out in the algorithm. Let's do this. The first thing that this report covers is kind of a general overview of how the gaming market in Web3 is kind of growing at a slower pace than it was in previous years, but it is still actually growing and teams are actively creating Web3 games. So you can see as expected in 2021 with the kind of Web3 boom and 2022, as this continued, a lot of Web3 games started and a lot of Web3 games were halted in, I guess, later in 2022, as things kind of started to settle down. In 2023, if I move out of the way here, you can see we have 223 games launched and 43 games halted. So still a much larger amount of games being created than everything before 2021, but it is growing at a slower pace compared to the last two years. A trend that is kind of going on in the broader Web3 industry, I would say, is there's a big focus on infrastructure as people kind of started to create these applications and create these games and realize, well, you know, some of the infrastructure required for me to actually create something that is scalable to the level that we would expect in Web2 land is actually not really laid out as a foundation yet. So a lot of the focus of 2022 and a lot of the focus in 2023 was to actually create the infrastructure for games and game studios to be able to come in and say, okay, here is a scalable enough solution that I can create and launch my game or have some Web3 aspects of the game that I'm launching onto a network that can actually handle this level of transactions per second and this level of demand for actual block space. So you can see in 2021, there was around 800 games launched with 28 networks more focused towards gaming. And that ratio kind of gets slowly higher and higher. As you can see in 2022, there was 11 games per network. In 2023, there was 2.8 games per network, which is kind of insane to think about. There's 81 networks tailored towards gaming and 223 games that are actually going onto those networks. But I think as we go throughout this report, it'll start to make sense why that's actually the case. I found this slide especially fascinating, which was six out of 10 Web3 games are excluded from mainstream distribution platforms. So that means you can't go to things like Steam, can't go to things like the App Store or the Android Store, whatever that's called. You cannot actually download these through mainstream platforms that most people are comfortable and familiar with in order to even have a distribution channel for people to discover and download their games onto these devices. So you can see here, there's a pretty insane stat, which is 63% were actually directly distributing, which means you would go onto, uh, let's say that game's website and you would download the game directly from that website onto your computer, onto your phone or whatever you're playing it on. And that is just something that's not something that I remember doing in the Web2 gaming industry in like the past 10 years. So this is a huge issue, I would say. And the next couple of slides that go and talk further about this distribution is very exciting to me because right now there's 63% that are doing direct distribution, 41% that are doing web two distribution and 17% are doing web three distribution. If you're wondering like me, I was like, that doesn't add up to 100%. It's because uh, you can kind of do more than one uh, distribution channel, right? So that's why it doesn't add up to hundred. A couple of games have multiple distribution channels. So the next slide talks about Epic Games, which is kind of leading the charge in this web three game distribution. So you can see every month since June, 2022 over here, which started at two, I know my head's blocking it. I'm sorry about that, but it goes June, two games, July, three games all the way. And it kind of trends up every single month with more and more Web3 games being listed on the Epic Games Store. Now, if you don't know what Epic Games Store is, this is where huge games like Fortnite are available. In order to download Fortnite, you need to go through the Epic Games Store. Epic Games Store is a place where you can discover and easily install these games uh, to 
your machine, right? So if you want to play Fortnite, you download Epic Games, you download Fortnite through Epic Games. And then while you're there, you can discover all of these other different games that might be on sale or might be kind of algorithmically tailored to be suggested to you so that, you know, you get kind of interested games that you might be interested in, right? So this is super important for games to have a place to be discovered and have a place where people feel comfortable and familiar to even download them onto their devices. This is a pretty interesting stat that I think has a underlying meaning to it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know anything about game development, but this is my assumption is that 44% of the uh, Web3 PC games are using Unreal Engine and 51% are using Unity, which to me, and maybe I'm incorrect in saying this, kind of suggests that there is a bigger trend towards indie games rather than play games or AAA games who I assume, and I could be wrong, again, I'm not a game developer, who I assume would create their own engines, except for games like Fortnite and some other popular games that use Unreal Engine, to actually build their own engines and build their own games on top of their own engine. And this is actually supported later in the uh, report as well, with 1% of games and 5% of games being AAA and play respectively. And then the broader market is kind of called midsize, which is uh, less than 10 million in funding, and indie, which is classified as small teams without financial support or investors. In terms of what chains these game studios are opting in for to launch their games on, Polygon's ecosystem hosts the most Web3 games today, followed by the Binance chain BNB, followed by Ethereum mainnet itself, and then we have Solana, Immutable, AVAX, Arbitrum, and so on and so forth. So this is not that surprising. I think a lot of companies would want to access the widest audience possible, which would typically be Ethereum, which kind of leads you to say, well, Ethereum's too expensive and too slow for high volume and high traffic uh, applications such as games, which kind of leads them to say, well, Polygon is the, you know, the closest solution to Ethereum with identical development experience, which offers these cheap fees and more uh, kind of transactions per second than what Ethereum offers. Offers. In terms of the L2 ecosystem, we have Immutable kind of dominating the space in L2 with a lot of the most popular Web3 games being launched on Immutable, which is great to see. And then finally, for non-EVM chains, non-Ethereum virtual machine chains, we have Solana kind of taking a clear lead in this category here. In a broader trend kind of category of what virtual machine these games are building, things like their smart contracts or their NFTs or tokens or whatever they're integrating into their games. EVM is massively dominating this space. I think this is a broader trend that we see in the Web3 industry, and I think we will continue to see the EVM be the standard and alternative VMs will still have a place in kind of these uh, specialized or niche categories of games and Web3 applications. But my personal belief is that this EVM category, which my head is currently blocking, will continue to dominate these games and continue to dominate the broader Web3 application adoption as well. What I think the explanation for so many networks coming out alongside the games is this trend that we're going to see in 2023 and what I believe throughout 2024 and beyond is these app chains being built to kind of host the uh, Web3 aspects of the game specific to each game. So each game will create their own app chain potentially where required, where they want to have specific rules for the chain. They want to have their own block space specific to the game, specific to the players of that game, rather than having some of their players experience congestion on the network, experience spikes in fees to kind of external things that they can't control. Instead, they will use things like the Polygon CD DK, which I have a video about on my channel or other solutions like the OP stack in the optimism world, for example, to spin up an app chain and have all of the smart contracts deployed to that app chain since it's going to be the exact same development experience to actually build and deploy your smart contracts to those app chains rather than the kind of shared layer twos or layer threes or even alternative layer ones. What I think we're going to see in 2024 is the interoperability between all of these app chains, which is what's kind of going to be the next step for the Polygon CDK, and which is what I'll be creating uh, content regarding in the next couple of months is the interoperability and aggregation layers that are kind of powering the Polygon CDK to create this connectivity between all of the L2 chains. So for example, if I wanted to create my own game, I determined that I need a designated chain to host 
host my own block space, to host my own smart contracts, and I don't want my users to experience any congestion, I create my own ZK powered L2 via this CDK. I want users to have that interoperability to swap their assets from my games chain to another chain and utilize the applications on the more popular chains like Polygon Proof of Stake or Polygon ZK EVM or Immutable ZK EVM, for example, and access the communities across these different L2s. So I think this is a trend we're going to see massively spike in 2024, and it's great to see that it's already happening in 2023. I think this is one of my favorite slides from the deck, which kind of leads us into the third section of this video, where we're going to talk about how these games that are being created are actually integrating these Web3 technologies and blockchain technologies into the game. And I think this is going to be a trend and something that I actually predicted in this article. You're probably wrong about Web3 Gaming about six months ago, where I said uh, these fully on-chain games are kind of not going to be the trend that we're going to see going forward, and that the real value lies in these in-game economies and utilizing uh, the kind of built-in buying and selling and trading and ownership of the assets that you can purchase kind of alongside the actual game itself. So this slide was very exciting to me, which was this 83% of games are pretty much just using the assets for the on-chain technology, right? So this kind of means there's an actual game itself, which is separate from the in-game economy, which is a very a popular way of doing things that I would say is seen in games like Counter-Strike, it's seen in games like League of Legends, seen in games like Fortnite. Every kind of popular game that is out there has the actual game itself and has a separate economy where you can buy either cosmetic items or items that have in-game utility in things like Hearthstone or, or trading card games, things like that, right? So really Really, there's a core game that you can play and then there's a separate in-game economy which is where I personally think these web3 technologies and these blockchain technologies have the most utility and the, there's really the home of where the that technology is even going to fit in into this gaming world. So 83% are categorized as games with on-chain assets, which really means hey, they have a separate game and then they have an in-game economy, which is using the blockchain to kind of host and power those items. And then 12% and 5% respectfully, respectively rather are hybrid on-chain games, which I think there's a definition somewhere here, which means games that integrate beyond in-game assets, elements of the game state on-chain. So there's some elements of the game state on-chain alongside some traditional game servers. And then obviously games, uh, fully on-chain games, are games that use blockchain technology to support the complete gaming backend. So essentially 5% are fully on-chain. They don't even have any uh, kind of servers separate from the blockchain itself. 12% are kind of having some state on chain, some state uh, on a kind of web two server, I guess you could call it. And then 83% are kind of fully off chain games, I would say, and then a separate in-game economy to actually manage those on the blockchain, which is defined here. So games that utilize the blockchain to tokenize fungible and non-fungible in-game assets. So essentially uh, NFTs and uh, kind of ERC 721, ERC 1155, ERC 20 tokens are stored to represent in-game assets alongside the actual core mechanics of the game. So this is awesome to me because I actually wrote about this around six months ago in this article, which I'll link in the description where I said the game itself and the game assets are actually kind of separate ecosystems. So games usually have some kind of separate economies to them where players use in-game currencies to purchase in-game items. So for League, we have using RP to buy a cosmetic skins in Counter-Strike, which is now CS2, I guess is using this kind of Steam money to purchase skins, which is cosmetic items for the game, which is completely separate and an optional part of the game. Fortnite, which is using the in-game currency of, of V-Bucks to buy, again, completely separate cosmetic items that are not necessary to require, uh, are not required to play the game, I should say. And then what I said, which maybe is a bit harsh, is that blockchains are not suitable to actually run the games themselves. I think there is some niche categories and concepts where that is not necessarily true. And you can, as we saw in that report, actually run the complete game on chain. So maybe that's a bit unfair of me to say, but the point I'm making here is essentially the trend that I think we're seeing already and the trend that I think we're going to see moving forward is that the blockchain and the Web3 technologies are going to be used to power that in-game economy that is completely separate from the actual game itself. Now, why would companies do this on-chain rather than off-chain? 
Well, that is kind of a different discussion based on where that company is at. So I would say if you're a smaller gaming studio, you can use the benefits of the built-in capabilities that these tokens have, like the ability to trade them between accounts, like the ability to list them for sale for a set price of any given currency, receive that in code, which is completely plug up and playable across any front end, any game, any language, you can completely customize this on any UI and have community members build external sites to even create these marketplaces themselves. So out of the box, you're getting the ability to create an in-game economy. You're getting the ability for external parties to access all of the information about the in-game economy, allowing the kind of empowerment of these third-party sites like marketplaces, for example, without having a full-time paid team to build out the marketplace, build out the in-game economy, uh, build out the API to power these third-party sites, build out the marketplaces to facilitate all of this trading between players. That is all available out of the box. Now, the follow-up argument to that is why would a company kind of give up control? For example, the Steam marketplace, they're taking a 10 or a 15% of all trading profits essentially. So if I sell something for $100, they're taking 10 or $15 out of that every single time. So it's probably more profitable for them to have this as a centralized service over a decentralized one. I think that is an interesting argument where I don't have the perfect idea of why a company like Steam would want to introduce a decentralized marketplace over what they currently have. I think it's really up for the players to kind of realize the value that they can get of these assets out of the game and kind of expect this from companies to say, well, X company is doing this in a decentralized way and I get benefit one, two, three, four, five out of that decentralized system and then start to kind of put pressure on these centralized marketplaces over time to say, well, you know, you're the ones being greedy and taking these benefits and the kind of standards away from what is available in this decentralized world to benefit within the form of profit, I guess. I don't have the 100% answer to that follow-up question, but I think it is an interesting discussion uh, nonetheless. Again, massive shout out to Game7, the full report where you can download the 61-page document if you are interested in reading more things like the kind of high level overview of funding in the Web3 space as well. This will all be linked in the description below. With that said, hope you enjoyed this one and kind of my commentary on something that I'm very passionate about in general in both Web3 and gaming and how these kind of worlds collide. If you enjoyed this kind of content, please let me know in the description. It's a little bit different from the technical content that I usually cover, but I'd love to know your thoughts. If you wanna see more like this, let me know. Subscribe to the channel and like the video to help me out in the algorithm. Appreciate you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.